welcome to the Metal Voice. Today on the show, wow, look at this. You know, the Quiet Riot legacy or the estate, we'll call it. We've got Regina Benali and, of course, Alex Grassi, the guitarist of Quiet Riot. This is a treat. This is great. Thank you guys for uh, jumping on today. Thanks, Thanks for having us. Yeah, thank you for having me and Alex. <laughs> so the cool thing is, I bought this a long time ago. This was like the original one, the Rehab, mm -hmm. right? So there's going to be, I guess it's released now, right? The Rehab, what is it? Relapsed and Remastered? Is yeah. that it? And it includes the new song, you know, the Kevin Dubrow song, the Lost song, we'll call it. The Lost New Song, the Lost Old New Song. I'm not sure how to phrase it. But <laughs> I Can't Hold On, right? Written by uh, you and Kevin, right, Alex? Yes. 20 years ago, actually, we wrote it. All right. Let's just touch upon that song. Like, what, 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 you found it on an iPod. You had to, it was just guitar and vocals. What was that? Um, it, it was guitar and vocals on an iPod. We found it last year and we had Frankie left behind a bunch of drum tracks to use for exactly what we used it for. Mm -hmm. And we got together in the studio and figured out that it could actually work, extracted it off the iPod. And basically Rudy finished it up. I added some guitar solos. Regina played tambourine. Mm -hmm. And um, hey. it came out. It came out really good. <laughs> we brought in some background singers. Yep, you did. You did. It yep. sounded actually. I was pretty impressed with the song. I was really impressed. Uh, you know, first of all, the quality is pretty good. The, the audio quality is great. You added the drums. You, you reverse sort of engineered this, correct? Like you added. Yeah, the yeah. The I mean, out of necessity, we had to go with the, with the tracks we had to work with. I mean, what you hear on that demo, Kevin recorded it in his home studio. Him and I did it in 2003, and he had a nice microphone and he had the right pipes, and thankfully it all translated to 2023, 2022. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, and and uh, that guy AJ that we worked with is a genius editor, and he really took it apart and and nuanced every little note, and and we really took it in and listened and we played around with it and we tried things and we lived with it for a while. And then we tried different things and we lived with that for a while. And we really took our time with it and just babied this until it was perfect. Like how long did it yeah. take you guys to put it to Several finesse it? Months, months. I mean, yeah, we, I mean, we weren't working on it every day, but it, it was over the course of months. Yeah, to give you an idea how long we worked on it, the last mix that we sent in to get mastered is mix number 39. <laughs> there was 39 revisions on that song. This is like 2003. Mm -hmm. So you had one of those uh, iPods where you just sort of like, you know, the little, what do they call it, the wheel? Yeah, <laughs> it, was, it was, but it, it came off a of CDR because Kevin used to give me, we, we, we worked for, you know, weekend out in Vegas where he lived, and then he'd come to the airport and give me a CDR of what we did. So I dumped the CDR into my iTunes, which got transferred to an iPod and then disappeared. So the CDR is long gone too. So that was the only copy there was. The song's getting a lot of airplay on the radio. Yeah, okay. we are, it is. It is. I swear, it's going on iTunes. It's iTunes has been very difficult with yeah, us, yeah. <laughs> but it it will end up on iTunes. Ideally, it should have been when we released it, but it just didn't work out that way. Regina, is there any other songs like uh, floating around that you guys forgot about? Uh, I'm sure Frankie um, kept it, all kinds. I there mean, is so much, so much stuff in my garage and in storage units that I have to take apart in like formats that I don't even know how to play things on. So it's entirely possible that there are that there's more, but I don't know. You don't know. You don't know, Alex. What do you think? Well. I know that I wrote about seven or eight songs with Kevin during that time, a couple of which ended up on rehab. And, you know, based on, you know, if, once we get into all the CDRs and all the files and, you know, there's definitely more out there. It's just a matter of if we can dig it up and if we can make it work the way this one did. But I, can, you know, with a, thankfully we have AJ who's, who's kind of like, he's like, uh, he, it's crazy how talented the guy is. This is right up his alley. I mean, um, cause it's not only a production thing, it's a digital editing thing. Cause it's all after the fact. Yeah. So yeah, yeah, I'd say that's a very good possibility. All right. Alex, tell me about rehab and, and your, um, sort of, like, where did you fit in when that album was, uh, being made? I mean, you were in the band then you kind of like went in and out of the band then you get back, got it back into the band. Maybe you just want to tell me what really happened. 
Uh, well, rehab started with Kevin and I writing the initial five or six, seven songs we did. Two of them got eventually got onto rehab, but Frankie was writing with a guitar player um, named Neil Citron, and Kevin was writing with me, and then Glenn Hughes got involved. So it's kind of a mishmash of like three or four different writers. And um, the the album eventually came out in two thousand six. Yeah, and it, but it never got released digitally. So the thought process on this was. Let's add this song in that was initially written for rehab. It just didn't, it was, it was supposed to go on our next record. Unfortunately, Kevin passed away at that point. But um, the thought process is let's put it on iTunes and or Amazon, wherever you can get it digitally, because it's, it's never been on that platform or any of those platforms before. Regina, do you think that this is a sort of like the, the gem of the catalog that just never really got out there? Um, I think it's the gem of the catalog, other than mental health, obviously. Um, it's, they were much more mature and better writers and they put, mm -hmm. and they put a lot of time into, it's, this wasn't one of those albums that they're throwing out on Frontiers. Sorry, no offense, Frontiers, but it's not one of those. This was a, this was, this was a labor of love that they really took their time on and they put a lot into it and they wanted to write something that they actually liked that was more direct from their personal influences, like mm -hmm. like like Spooky Tooth and uh, yeah. all all of the the seventies albums that they were raised on and th that actually made them musicians. So uh, this is more personal and mature, and um, it kind of it didn't really. I, I it did get the best reviews that they'd ever gotten. But it didn't really get that much attention, I think, partially because Kevin died so soon right after. Yeah. You would think that that would make people want to go to that, but it didn't. They just, it just kind of like didn't really get the love that it deserved. Yeah, I think that's a good way to put it. What would be about you, Alex? You listened to the early days of Quiet Riot and then you listened to this album, more of a mature uh, direction. Uh, well, I think it's because this album was, I think the first one they did that was self-funded. Kevin and Frankie paid for it themselves. Yeah. They didn't have to answer to a record company that wanted them to rewrite Metal Health a million times. And, you know, Kevin Kevin and Frankie were both really proud of it. I mean, Kevin got his, one of his wishes is to sing a duet with his hero, Glenn Hughes. Yeah, yeah, it's and and then also write with Glenn. I mean, that's bucket list stuff, man. So <laughs> I, I'm glad that they got that out before he, he passed away because I know he was... He said it was his favorite record he ever did for the band. So, all right, cool. Regina, the estate of Quiet Riot. So, and you're you're in charge of this now, right? You're 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 like the headmaster. Were you responsible for these guys? No, I'm responsible for the name, but not those guys. Because, so I, you may or may not know, I've spoken to Frankie. I've interviewed him so many times. Mm -hmm. And I've always bothered him about Quiet Riot 1 and Quiet Riot 2, but you had nothing to do with that? that um, I licensed the use of the name for, to those people, and then I split that with the four guys so that they got paid for it. Because they've never gotten paid. They've never, ever gotten paid for that. So I did take the opportunity to license the name to country to, to, to companies that are out of the country making bootlegs, essentially. And... Hey, they're willing to pay me for the name. I split it with the original members, so they got a check. So, but this was sort of like Frankie's sort of last wish. Is that what it was? Like, is just to yeah, he, things? not really a last wish because he wasn't emotionally invested in that. He just was talking with them, and uh, he thought it was a good idea because he was like, "Well, it's kind of hard to fight companies in other countries. So if somebody comes forward and they actually want to do it the right way." That's right. Um, I think it was great. I think it was a great idea. It's already, all those songs are on YouTube. Yeah. So it's not like, <laughs> we're just, it's not like you can't get them. And, yeah, it, no. it, you know, so what, so the, we, he didn't see the harm in it. So. Regina, tell me about like your background. So a lot of people understand where you come from, you know, a director and actress and all that um, fun stuff. God, I was an actress a million years ago, but. I come from film and television and I came into it as an actor, but um, wanted to be a director and did some directing before I met Frankie and then uh, directed the film 
the Quiet Riot documentary that was on Showtime. Mm -hmm. And I was supposed to be, this was, this was the period right now where I was supposed to be off on my own making my independent films. But Frankie passed away and things changed and it's kind of fell in my lap. And I, um, you know, and I, I, I will still do some of that, but uh, I can't treat Quiet Riot like a side hustle. And it does require uh, something, you know, things to be overseen and, and make sure that that it's being respected and that it's being done well and done right. And that the guys that are currently in the band are working and doing well and waving the flag for Quiet Riot forever. Well, you know, there's a lot of people who do die and sometimes the estate does not do justice to the legacy, right? Yes, that happens a lot. And a lot of times families uh, of these people uh, through, you know, of course they don't, they're not in the business. They're not in the entertainment industry at all. And they don't really know what to do. They, they, they do their business with their grief. They let their grief direct how they do business. And I don't do that. I grieve with my grief hat on and then I take my grief hat off and I do business with my business head and I'm in the industry already. So I already kind of, there's a lot of overlap there and I, and I understood. And also I worked with Frankie with the band as well. So I, I, I don't let I don't let my grief or my emotions cloud things. I just make sure that everyone's being respected and that and that it's being done respectfully. Okay. Well, I'm like, like I just want to say that there's some <laughs> you have to have the fans ex- want some yeah. sort of output and they want to like you like Alex found this song. They want that. I mean, there is a, the fans do want that. They do want a, those hidden gems and a live albums or mm-hmm. and sides. Fa- or yeah. And a lot of times families covered this up and they, and they hide it away and they're like, no, he's ours. And this is, and they, you know, and it's not really, do, in my opinion, doesn't do the, the person justice. I think if you have their art and you can keep it out there, um, I think that that's better. That's my opinion. That that's how I do things, and other people are welcome to do however they feel. But yeah. What about you, Alex? What was your first sort of meeting with? I don't remember in the documentary how you first met Frankie and Kevin, and how you started, you know, with Quiet Riot. Um, I met I'm sure Kevin. It explains it in the movie, but I don't remember. Go ahead. Uh, not, it doesn't really touch on that, I don't think. Um, I met Let's Kevin in 2003. <laughs> okay. um, I'm trying to spend so, so many things going on. Um, I met Kevin in 2003 when he was doing a solo tour. He had done a, a covers oh, yeah, record on, yeah. with Mike Varney's label, Shrapnel. And there was no Quiet Riot at that point. And then come 2004, they got that together and Kevin called me up. I'll never forget, I was, I was in he, at Heathrow Airport coming back from a tour of London with another band of, of the UK. And I got a voicemail. I called my voicemail and Kevin said, as soon as you land, call me. I got good news. I'm like, <laughs> oh boy, what, what's this going to be? And he, he asked me to join the band. And I met with Frankie at some Mexican place and signed the contract. Next thing you know, I'm in Quiet Riot. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty much it. It's it's, it's a huge legacy, right? Um, he's, he's being well, a little humble. Kevin and Frankie <laughs> really, really almost raised him to they be did. the musician and that he is yeah they really they put him through the ringer but they really <laughs> molded him he was handpicked by by kevin molded by kevin and frankie yes was it alex was it an uphill battle i mean you know you're you know if you want to really go back into the history of choir right randy rhodes right carlos yes and you know that people expect a certain amount of you know the it's all on you you know the guitar you're you know it's one guitar band right yeah, it, it it was it was really an uphill. It was more just finding myself within that music because anybody can clone it note for note like one of those steel metal shop type bands. But Kevin always said, make make you know play the, the hit song solos note for note, but do your own thing and the other stuff too. Make it your own and be yourself. 
that was the best advice he ever gave me. Just be yourself, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And what about you, Regina? When, when did you first meet Frankie? The first time I met Frankie was in, in October of 1983. I was, I was a kid. I, uh, I had a friend who knew them and you're only five, right? I, yes, I, <laughs> I, I got the day off from kindergarten <laughs> um, and I, uh, I went to a few of their shows. I had a crush on Frankie, but you know, of course they thought of me as like a little kid. And uh, I, you know, we lost touch. And around 2009, I was pitching shows to networks and I was working with someone. And, and around this time, this was like an era, like around Rock of Love when VH1 was had all these like trashy rock and roll shows. And among the many shows I was pitching, I was working with another rock star who I'm not going to name, but we kind of came up with this idea for this show. And around that time, I, I ran into Carlos somewhere and then I he remembered meeting me when I was a kid, you know. So then, I, so then it just kind of planted in my mind. I thought, oh, I should like reach out to Frankie, and and so I reached out and I was like, hey, you know, I'm pitching the show and we need guys for this band for the show. And um, by the way, I met you, and and I don't know if you remember. Here's a picture of me when I was young, and he and it was like, oh, hi. Um, I don't think I remember you, but um, <laughs> I'm single now, and I'd love to take you out for coffee. And so I was like, oh um okay and so we did that and the show never happened but we got together okay all right good alex long story (laughs) no no it's all good you know these are you know sometimes in a documentary you have like 90 minutes to squeeze everybody oh yeah in there i didn't even talk about me him and i in the documentary at all because it was about us so there's there's just so much more information right about yes. your relationship yes alex was it a, like you know i'm watching a documentary and you know i see quiet ride and a guy i followed quiet ride probably since the beginning right and the singer changes and the singer changes and this, did that at one point just get out of control you know until you found jizzy i mean it just uh find, you know it right did and it did it did and it didn't because i think all of us kind of knew that you know, you don't know till you try something. And I think having the, the unknown guys come in looked good on paper because it worked for Journey, but that's not really how Journey did it, apparently. And we kind of found out the hard way, but, you know, it, it all led to where we are now, you know. And Jizzy is definitely the guy. I mean, he's he's a pro. And, he, uh, you know, we always talk about how he has the same lineage as, as like, you know, Rudy does and, and to a smaller extent I do, coming from the Sunset Strip and being having drank from the same well, you know um is you know it's quite right they would love hate so there's a lot of there's a lot of uh synergy there if you will so we yeah. we all work really well together but yeah it was a little the whole singer thing we, we did a lot of photo shoots <laughs> let's just leave it at that you know? Nice. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> you know you know what i loved about the film i'll tell you i think what you did really well was sort of like the in and out of the bands that <laughs> portion right and this guy came in and that guy came in and this guy came in it was done well where you kind of got the whole history in, a, in about 30 seconds or whatever it was, like a minute or two. And it's not easy to do. Right. It's definitely not easy to do, right? Yes. yes. Um, what about re-releases, like the Down to the Bone? and Yeah, that's coming next. Down to the Bone is coming next. Okay. As far and, as digital release. What else are we missing? We're missing Down to the Bone. Guilty Pleasures, probably. Guilty Pleasures. I don't know. I have to go back through all my contracts and and and. I'm assuming you can't touch like the Quiet Riot three and the Crit- Condition Critical because no. mm-hmm. those are by CBS. Or, I, uh, I Sony. Think. Sony, yeah, yeah, yeah. Although we have, we have um, sent them papers to get our rights back on all those, but they're not cooperating. Okay. What else? Legally, legally, they belong to us, but they're not cooperating. And in that garage, is there are there live albums that you're not unaware yeah. of? Yes, like there are. Live 1984, 84. There are live, yes, in my locked closet. And yes, and in various storage units. 
there are these reels of tapes of live performances. So, what about a Quiet Riot two documentary? I have thought about that. I have thought about taking the current documentary and, but I mean, it's already almost two hours, and then adding to it. I well, you'd have to get another angle, right? I mean. Yeah, it can't be about Kevin dying and Frankie replacing him. And like, yeah, I, I just, that's a lot. We that's could brainstorm lot. right here. Uh, Alex, any ideas? I know. <laughs> Listen, the first documentary was, I had a very simple idea and it was supposed to be executed quickly and things didn't pan out that way. And it ended up taking five years. So I'm a little hesitant to start over because I don't want to spend five years on some, on another one. I hear you. Okay. A lot. All right. It's a lot. What about new music, Alex, in terms of the next album, right? Are, are, uh, you, well, get, are you using Frankie's sort of tracks that he left behind, you know, or are you just writing yeah. completely new stuff? Yeah, there's about doing? four or five songs done that we, writ that we wrote and record to Frankie's tracks. They just need to be mixed and mastered. And we have to honestly, when we found I Can't Hold On, that kind of cut to the front of the line with everything else. So now we just got to, we haven't really discussed what's next, but we're in a good position. So Neil now, Citron think, and Frankie were writing together, right? In no, the these whole... are tracks. These are brand new tracks that Frankie left behind that I've written to and Rudy's played bass on. I have hun I have dozens of Frank of Frankie drum tracks, raw drum yeah. tracks. And so the other musicians write songs and we can use those drum tracks on them. So he's talking about uh, new songs that he's written and Rudy's written. And um, so it's, so it's now it's currently the writers are the band members. Okay. All right. So it's going to be a combination, what you're saying of some of brand new stuff, completely brand new stuff. And some of the, sort of, uh, we'll call it, or don't call it leftovers, but tracks that you didn't use uh -huh. that Frankie wrote in the past. Is that it? No, no, he's, no. I'm talking, when I say Frankie tracks, I mean raw drum tracks. Yeah. Okay. But raw drum tracks to songs. No, they're, they're just, just no. drum tracks. They're just yeah. tracks. So you, they, and they're in d different, um, you know. Time signatures. All, all kinds of fills and times. Yes, exactly. Yeah. So you're like, oh, I have this song. What and you try out the new yeah. tracks and see what goes with it. Okay. And you Alex. Frankenstein it around. What about what about Quiet Riot Metal Health, the the tour you're going on? Right? Is this like the whole album? You're playing the complete album from start to finish. Is that what it's about? Um, pretty much. Yeah. You know, it's the 40th anniversary this year, and um, it's it's pretty much all the you know all the hits. Pretty much all of Metal Health, I believe, except for this one one bonus track that we haven't done yet. But um, and then the stuff off Condition Critical, and it's pretty much those first two albums is what makes up the set. Um, just come out and see us play. Not me. Yeah, we have we have a really busy, we have a good year coming up. We've got some really good shows so far, and a lot more that are going to be announced soon. Okay. All right. So this is starting when, Alex? This is starting. Um. Well, there's. A the band's going to be on the cruise, the Jericho cruise in a couple weeks. Mm -hmm. And then the first tour dates pick up in March. We're doing um, Mohegan Sun Casino in Connecticut. We're doing mm -hmm. Seven Feathers Casino in Oregon, in uh, oh, Canyonville, yeah. Oregon. Then we're going back to the Whiskey on March 25th for the official kickoff, if you will, of the 40th anniversary tour. Mm -hmm. uh, M3. We're going to be at M3. M3 this. Festival, yeah. Um and we got some dates with Skid Row again. We did a lot of shows with them last year. It was a great package. And our friends in Slaughter, we're playing with them. You know, just, you know, our, we, 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 we mainly do fly dates. So they're kind of all sporadic around the country. So the routing kind of trickles in. But there's about 22 or 23 shows confirmed already for the year. Now just come out and see us. It's going to be a good year. It's going to be a good tour. All right. Well, guys, thanks for uh, jumping on. Thank you very much, and I wish you all the best, okay? Thanks for having us. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. Thank you.